Have you ever experienced a moment when a small act of kindness completely changed your day? What hidden power does intention behind every act of kindness hold versus spontaneous ones? What impact can intentional acts of kindness have on our mental and emotional well-being? And can one person's intentional act of kindness create a dominant effect of goodness, a chain reaction of positivity? Feeling inspired to spread kindness, but not sure where to start? No worries, we got you covered. Join me after the intro for a conversation with a very special friend with whom we will answer this and many more questions. So grab a cup of coffee, settle in, and let's start. Hi, I'm Rosanna D, and this is Forgiven Tribe, a podcast where we explore what thriving in life means and how we can achieve it irrespective of our past, current condition, and expectations that those around us, or society in general, may have. Let's go. Welcome to the Forgiven Tribe Show. We live in a world where the clamor of chaos often echoes loud, where self-absorption sometimes clouds our vision, where the threads of human connection seem to fray, where negativity seems to seep into every corner, leaving a trail of broken hearts and souls, where stress and tension tangle in the streets and acts of cruelty and indifference echo through the walls of our society. The fast-paced and noisy lives we have far too often leave us in fear and uncertainty, as well as completely disconnected from one another. In this world, it can be all too easy to forget the impact of simple acts of kindness. Living unkindly or in a world that appears unkind poses its own set of challenges, challenges that affect us all, whether we realize it or not. So today we embark on an unforgettable exploration, delving into the very essence of intentional acts of kindness and the extraordinary transformation it can bring to our lives and our world. We discuss what lies behind the magic, a glimpse into how this small, thoughtful gesture has the power to ripple through hearts and minds, setting off a chain reaction of positivity. And we dive into this fascinating topic in a conversation with our guest, Alan Questel. Alan is the author of Practice Intentional Acts of Kindness and Like Yourself More. He's known for his clarity, creativity, and down-to-earth style of teaching. He brings a depth of understanding, humor, and gentle human perspective while creating lively conditions for learning. Alan has taught thousands of people in over 20 countries and five continents. He's constantly discovering how to be kinder to others and towards himself. His book takes readers through steps to broaden and sharpen their understanding of kindness. It shows ways to embrace kindness in everyday life and provides the means to be kinder and generate more kindness towards yourself and others. Hi, Alan. Welcome to the Forgiven Try Show. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for having me today. Fantastic. Alan, I love this topic. I, I think the world really needs uh, a little mm -hmm. bit more kindness, right? So uh, I'm really uh, ecstatic to, to talk about it. But before we dive into that, I would love to know a little bit more about you and right. in particular your journey to discover the power of kindness, because yeah. kindness is something that we are all aware of, but the power that it holds perhaps is, is not that known. Right. right. I think I think the, the power and also the concrete ways of engaging around kindness are not so evident to many of us. So, but my journey began. Let's see, there are a few kind of roads that led me to, to write this book. And I would say one of the first things is the other work I do, which is called the Feldenkrais Method which is a movement technique based on learning theories. I work with people with orthopedic, neurological problems, actors, professional athletes, people who want to change their self-image. And there's two modalities. One's hands-on, one's in groups. And the movements in groups are done very small and very slow, which allows you your attention to wander more freely through the rest of yourself. And at one point, I was putting together a workshop on self-image. And, and I started to think, 
that our self-image was really a reflection of how much we like ourselves or how much we don't like ourselves. And over time, playing with this idea, I actually started to think, this is my job, to help people like themselves more. And there's a... In the movements that people do, I'm always reminding them to go slower and smaller. And then I started playing with another idea. And the idea was, can you move in a way that you like the way it feels? And it's very interesting because even though people are moving slowly, when I ask that question, often it changes things, right? They don't consider moving in a way that they actually like the way it feels. And so this is an idea that I've taught for many, many years. I think one of the best or most gratifying moments I've had in teaching it was a program I had in Australia. And my trainings are four years long, so the, I get to know people pretty well. And at the end, when they graduated, people would come up and I'd give them their certificate and give them a hug. And they'd whisper in my ear, I like myself more now. And I thought, wow, that made it so worthwhile, everything I was doing. And this idea of liking ourselves more sounds great. I often ask people, is there anyone in the room who doesn't want to like themselves more? And they all kind of smile funny, you know. But no one says no to that. But when, when we consider that idea, what often comes up for people are all the things they don't like about themselves. And that's a tricky moment, one where we have to be especially kind and gentle with ourselves. So this has been the, the, the road, the path that I've been on. And then at one moment, I thought, well, this way of exploring it is very intrapersonal within ourselves. How can I make it more interpersonal? And I kind of was living with that idea for a while. And one day I happened to do an act of kindness and I realized right afterwards that I felt better. I liked myself more. And I'm not proposing the idea that we just try to do all these kind acts to pat ourselves on the back and like ourselves more. But I thought that's kind of the answer, that if we can do more acts of kindness, it feeds back to us in terms of our self-image and how we feel about ourselves. And of course, it contributes to the world. And it, it speaks directly what you spoke about at the beginning, this idea of connection, connection with ourselves and connection with others. And so those are, that's kind of the general road that I took and there's more, but maybe I'll come to that later or something. Uh, absolutely. But you know what is uh, quite interesting is that if you ask people, well, are you kind? Uh, and everybody will say, oh, of course I am, right? Nobody um, likes the idea of being unkind, whether it's well, towards others or themselves. But we don't reflect about it. We don't uh, stop and say, okay, we need to talk about this topic. Why do you think? Uh, is is like that. Well, we we take kindness yeah. almost for granted. That's a good question. I, I think. Well, first of all, I, I I agree with you. I've met people who who don't think they're kind, and they kind of relish in it. That's their self image. They're a curmudgeon. They're someone who goes, ah, I don't need to be kind. That's from other people, you know. Now, what's really funny is I meet people like that who actually are kind. And I meet people who tell me how kind they are, and they're not so kind. So it's a, it's a mixed thing. But I think that one of the gaps in terms of, or the reasons that we can take this for granted, is because I don't think we have enough concrete ways to practice it, to understand it. I think most of the time, if you, if you look up the dictionary definition of kindness, one of the synonyms for it is generosity. So we all like generosity, but look, if we start to investigate generosity, that can be pretty misunderstood too, right? Some Many people think they're generous, they're not, they, vice versa, they give gifts that are too big or too small, or they give to get. So it's not quite a clean interaction when they do something like that. So, But not only is, is kindness equated with generosity in the dictionary, and what I'm going to say is actually true of most dictionary definitions, that the definitions are from the observer's point of view. They're not from the doer's point of view. So, so for example, to sit. 
to sit, one definition is to rest upon your buttocks or thighs. Okay, we can see what that looks like. But if you tell a child with cerebral palsy, rest upon your buttocks and thighs, they can't, they fall over. That doesn't give any information about how to sit. So when we look at the definitions of kindness, there aren't many definitions that tell you how, like compassion or empathy. People ask me, you know, is, is my book about compassion and empathy? And I, of course, how could it not be? But more important, it's about concrete things we can do every day in an easy, approachable way to find success in it that builds and grows until one day, it's not like a clear line that we cross, but one day we look back and go, you know, I think, I think maybe I'm a little kinder than I used to be. Maybe I like myself more. So I think that, because the idea of kindness and loving kindness, it's everywhere in our cultures. And again, as you were saying, we live in some really challenging times. And yet, I don't know anyone, even the kindest people I know, who couldn't benefit from being a little kinder to themselves Absolutely. and to others too. Absolutely, I agree more with, with that. If you think of your experience and the experience of everybody you have talked to uh, about this topic, um, can you recall a, mm -hmm. a time or a situation where, for example, an uh, intentional act of kindness uh, created such a profound impact uh, on you and that perhaps changed you in some way or changed your perspective? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I can. It's one of the other paths that led me to the book, actually. And it was only year, sometime later, years actually, that I recognized it as it, how impactful it was. And that was a time when my father, he had unfortunately run out of money. And my brother and I, fortunately, were able to help him and support him. But he struggled. And it, then he developed dementia. And we eventually had to put him in a home and it was a nice home. It was in Florida where he lived with my stepmother. And it was coming to the summer. And at the beginning of the summer, my stepmother was going to leave Florida, go to New York to see her kids and grandkids. And I realized my father's going to be all alone. And I was never close to my father. I wasn't alienated from him, but there was no strong connection, really. It was, you know, it was a typical... 1950s father, I guess. And so we got, we got along, you know. And then I got this idea, and I don't know where it came from. I thought, I'm going to call him every day. And I lived in California at that time, and he was in Florida, so the time difference worked. So every day I'd wake up and I'd call him. And he always knew who I was. Sometimes he'd talk gibberish. Sometimes he'd have the phone upside down or something, and he couldn't hear me. But we talked every day. And that that taught me such a lesson about one, one of the biggest components, I think, that, that are necessary in terms of generating kindness, which is practicing something. So I practiced that for three years. Three years every day I called him. And, I'm, you know, there were times I might go away to a meditation retreat where it was silent, I couldn't call. And I was so worried that he's, he didn't miss me. He was demented, you know. He didn't know one day or another. But when he passed, I still in the morning would wake up, oh no, he's gone, and I put that down. And then I realized that act, and, and I talk about this in the book, I talk about five minutes a day, giving someone else your attention for five minutes a day, which sounds easy, but it is not easy. Five minutes could be really drawn out. I would say to my dog, I'm giving you five minutes of my attention now. And after two minutes, I'm like, I'm going to check my email, do this, do that, you know. And so I would say that that act towards my father really like opened up my attention and vision. And even today, I have, uh, I've had over the years too, a number of people in my life who I contact or I speak with every two or three weeks. And these are sometimes people who are very old, who don't have the capacity to reach out that much, or someone who's not so well. But I even have some young friends like that who have their own challenges, and I speak with them, and I take the time to do that. So that's 
I think that's probably the biggest event that, that moved me into this direction. What do you think? Because, I mean, five minutes, as you said, it doesn't look like a massive commitment, right? What does it take to to practice it? Because could it be that we don't really understand what kindness is? Mm. Uh, do, do we need to review again what the definition mm -hmm. uh, you talked before? It's uh, about generosity, yeah. it's about compassion, it's about a, a lot of things, but perhaps we just don't understand what gen what kindness really is, and perhaps there is a, a, yeah. a misconception, is something that is really big. And uh, we need That's to right. go the extra mile, where sometimes it, right. it, it takes very little, like a phone call. That's right. A very little, like a phone call, or just checking, do you need anything? Or I would say a, another big part of being kind that's, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it as a definition of kindness, but to me, it's at the essence of it, which is being able to listen, to just give someone some, your time to listen to them, even for a couple of minutes. Like if five minutes is too daunting for people, or they feel that they can't succeed at it, do two minutes, do one minute. Don't be unkind to yourself because you can't do five minutes, right? So, so doing two minutes, five minutes in different ways, right? Thinking of someone, maybe it's not even connecting with them on the phone or in person. Maybe it's just saying, I wonder how so-and-so is today and kind of giving our thoughts to that person for a while. But when you ask, the, you know, you point, you make the point about, do we know what kindness is? And I think that we all have a kind of basic understanding of what kindness is. But I all think, I also think, and I include myself in this as well, that there's so much more to learn. You know, I had um, a kind of a shocking experience in writing this book. So I would say, actually, I want to read you something, if that's okay. Please. So I would say that pretty much all the things that I talk about in the book and all of the exercises that I propose that people do, I, at this point, I feel pretty confident that I can do them. But what I didn't expect was once I completed the book, that the next level of me becoming kinder was is such a huge step that it's daunting. It's like, I don't know if I'll ever achieve that in my lifetime. And I can read you this quote that's in the book, it's from Ram Das, and it kind of speaks to this and I'll talk about it. He says, when you, go in, when you go out into the woods and you look at trees, you see all these different trees and some of them are bent. You sort of understand that it didn't get enough light, so it turned that way. And, and you don't get all emotional about it, you just allow it. The minute you get near humans, you lose all that. You're constantly staying you are to this, or I'm to this, this judgment mind comes in. And so, I practice turning people into trees, which means appreciating them just the way they are. So, I mean, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful quote. Beautiful, beautiful yeah. quote. I, yeah. I love that. This and, is very difficult to do. We yeah. have that yeah. uh, monkey mind that comes always right. in front of us and, and wants to judge everything and everybody. Right. Right. And so with this quote, I would say, and I, 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 I'm assuming I'm not alone in this, that I can be very judgmental. I can be sitting in an airport and what I can catch myself doing is staring at someone I don't know and making up a story about them. And it can be a negative story, it can be a positive story, but it's all made up anyway. And so I've been aware of that aspect of myself for a long time. And then this quote, like I said, really speaks to it. But you know what? When I'm at an airport and I'm looking at someone judging them like that, I can't think of this quote. It's too long, the quote. You know, am I going to get a tattooed on my arm? I'll have to read this every time or something, you know. But what I learned to do is to create some a real simple um, interruption. If I, But the thing is, I have to catch myself when I'm doing it. And if I can catch myself doing it, I just say, tree, and it's like, all the story I created dissolves and I see a person now and it's a whole different thing so it's kind of like you know the acts of kindness we're not we're never going to be done in terms of being kind we're never going to be done in terms of liking ourselves 
And the better we are at it, the more challenging it becomes. So I, I love this uh, little uh, exercise because it's uh, very quick and very effective, I think, of, of thinking, yeah. you know, like a pattern interruption with one right. single word and uh, we stop thinking whatever we were thinking before. So uh, thank you very much yeah. for suggesting that. I, I, I might actually <laughs> try, <laughs> try it myself. <laughs> Uh, That's good. Alan, if you uh, had to sort of list the benefits of uh, kindness or so intentional acts of kindness, where, where would you put the accent? And especially on the people involved, because when we think of yeah. kindness, uh, we think of the other person, but sometimes we discard the impact that being kind, I mean, this is uh, the story that you said before, the impact of mm -hmm. kindness that we give to others can have on us and in our world. Yeah, yeah. And, well, I think, that, I mean, it is a loop, you know, that, that continues back and forth with others. But I also think that we have to be a little bit cautious because I know many people who are kind to others but they have a hard time being kind to themselves. And I can tell you, when I was writing the book and I got to the part about being kind to ourselves, I got blocked for five years. Ah, and I was like, I thought I was kind to myself, but as I investigated it, it's like I didn't, I wasn't really as kind as I thought I was to myself, you know? So it's, 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 it's a, a process it's a... that can get fed from both sides, you know? And, and I think the, you know, the, the general perspective of kindness is that it's this big thing, right? And kindness exists in the world. But for me, it's in the everyday moments that it makes a difference, you know? And that, as I said in the beginning, that if I do an act of kindness towards someone, with someone else, then I have the chance that maybe I feel, oh, I, I feel a little better about myself at this point. But that doesn't mean, that means I might like myself a little bit more. That doesn't mean I have the capacity or the skill yet to be kind to myself. That's a whole different road to go down. And that takes, again, I'll come back to this word many, many times, practice. It's the only answer I know to growing any aspect of ourselves, whether it's playing a musical instrument or a sport or writing a book. You know how many editors I went through in my book? Because I had to practice it again and again and again and then do it again. And, you know, and since the book, I get other ideas and things like that. And so I think what we need, as I said before, are small things that we can practice every day that if we, if, if we don't do them, no one's going to come after us. It's just between me and myself. Mm. Or... If I misstep, I make a mistake, which of course has got to happen. It's how we learn. I learn more from my mistakes than my successes. And then if I misstep, make a mistake, that I can reflect on it and go, oh, I have to rethink this. I have to come at it in, from a different direction. And then, you know, I, I teach large groups for over periods of four years. And um, I've been doing it for quite a long time. And... <laughs> I've encountered some real challenges with the groups, you know, individuals, not the whole group. No, the, there was no mutiny, luckily, but individuals in the group, right? And so I kind of get through it and navigate it and find a new way of having a relationship with the person and feel good. And, I, and you know, after like a lot of those, I get to the point where I'm like, no, yeah, I think I've, come, I'm, I've bumped into all the bumps I'm going to encounter and then something else comes along that I never could have imagined. And now I have to figure this out. And, and figuring it out from the point of being kind to myself, to others, to myself being kind in a situation like that has more to do with having some clarity around my own boundaries of what feels acceptable to me, how far I can go with someone. But it's also about really trying to take a fresh look at this not this person, this tree, right? And be able to see who are they really? What are they asking for from me? What can I give them realistically? And if I can, to be able to say I can't do that. But if I can, oh, that's a shift for me. 
So it's um, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a good, worthwhile challenge. I'd uh, say. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I love what you are saying about how difficult it can be sometimes to be kind towards ourselves. And uh, actually, that really mm. hits home with me. Uh, yeah. I struggle for a very long time, and perhaps very much so uh, still, with self-love. And I can see yeah. a lot of people around that struggle with the same problem. You know, it's uh, yeah. we are perhaps capable of a lot of love towards others, but not mm. enough love towards ourselves. Yeah. And, and I yeah. agree with you when you say that a lot of that has to do with boundaries and what is acceptable and yeah. what is not. And uh, yeah. I always say I burn out out of uh, not having boundaries. So oh, it, it's, yeah. uh, it's really something that hits home and um yeah thank you very much for for stressing that that point at, at that point i think it's um it's important for everybody to to man, to remember uh, that we need to be kind mm -hmm. to ourselves we need to love ourselves because that's the only way we can be kind and and love others and uh, you, you know something cuz you use a word that i agree with for sure but it's it's a, I use a different word. Um, I, I was taking this workshop once called the Hoffman process. It was a very interesting process about your history with your parents, your, your, what you do. And in the in the workshop, you can't tell people what you do. So for five days, you're, and it's residential, so you're with these people all the time, and you don't reveal what you do to the very last day. And the very last day, and and, and the workshop is almost entirely. I would say, about loving oneself. And it's great, right? And in the last day, we, we, we revealed what we did with each other. And I was talking with about three or four other people. And I was describing my work. And, and I said, but really what I do is help people like themselves more. And they all said the same thing. They all went, oh, that sounds a lot easier than loving myself. I agree. To love ourselves but I had to learn to like myself first. I wasn't close to loving myself, you know? And sometimes the idea of loving oneself, it's too big. People have too many judgments about themselves and too many things that they feel are wrong that just interfere. And, and, and then they get upset with themselves for not being able to love themselves, which just loops them back into all of their negative thinking. And that's why liking ourselves is small, right? I can, I can share a story with you about that yeah. maybe. When I was 19, I moved out of my parents' house. And I lived in New York City, and uh, I had this realization. And this realization was, I don't do anything well. That was my self-image, not very positive. Now, I don't think people would see me like that. You know, I was quite outgoing and stuff, and I had a good sense of humor and engaged around things. But this is how I felt internally. And I thought, I, I don't do anything well. And I decided, I, I was fortunate that I came on a simple idea. I thought, okay, I'm going to learn to brush my teeth well. That sounds like simple. It's twice a day, right? Right? And if I don't do it, who's going to know? The dentist? No, he knows already, right? And so I started learning to brush my teeth well. And it, it was kind of like, it took time and there were ups and downs and it started to reveal to me a lot of my own internal voices of ways I would interfere and sabotage myself or stop myself. And then I started to realize that these voices I have around brushing my teeth, they're not just about brushing my teeth. I do it in a lot of areas of my life. And I actually felt at some point I'm accomplished at brushing my teeth. And that is one of the first places where I went, Oh, I like myself a little more now, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, no, I, I didn't think of it in those words. It was many years later that I came to that language, but I realized in retrospect that that was like that, one of, again, one of the seeds that helped me understand this and grow into this more and more. So it's a, it's a little thing, you know, it's like a secret thing almost. Who knows about it? But then we have to practice it. It's not like, Oh, I'm going to give myself a month to do this. It's like, no, no, you got to keep doing this, you know. Mm, I think I will start thinking of myself as a, a little tree <laughs> from now on. <laughs> That's, good. That's good. Alan, uh, 
you focus a lot of the attention when it comes to talking about kindness on the intentionality of the act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we talk about that and uh, the, the role of intention versus uh, spontaneous acts? Of yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think spontaneous or random acts of kindness are essential. And when they happen, they're joyous for us, you know, whether it's towards us or towards someone else. So they're fantastic like that. But the idea of intentional speaks again more to the practice of something, right? That I, I intentionally, when someone is learning to play an instrument, they practice every day. They have the idea to sit down and do it. When someone meditates, they sit down and do it. I meditated for many, many years. And I'll tell you honestly, if while I was lying in bed, I would do it first thing in the morning. If I had the thought, should I meditate? The warm bed, the hour that it was, it was dark outside still. Everything was saying, no, go back to sleep, right? And what I learned to do was to intentionally just not ignore my feelings, but to differentiate my feelings from the action to say, oh, everything in me is saying no, and I'm going to do it. That's intention. And I'm separating intention a little bit from will. Because will is a kind of forcing, can be a forcing of ourselves to do something, which can backfire. Then we start resenting something when there's too much will in doing something like that. But to be intentional is to have a certain clarity about what I want to do. And that's kind of the key thing, too, to intentional is like, what do I want? You know, I had a really funny experience many years ago in New York. In my private practice, I was seeing a woman, and she was kind of mopey, you know, and she'd come in, and, you know, we'd work, and, and one day she came in, and she was like this, and got three new jobs, and I said, what happened to you? And she said, I did the firewalk, fear into power. And you know, it's a thing, with was with Tony Robbins, and you walk on the fire, and I thought, that's fascinating. I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I figure, I can even deduct it, you know. <laughs> and so... It was in New York City, and it's, it was like a five-hour transinduction with Tony Robbins. And he was quite brilliant, I thought, as a presenter. And at the end, you'd walk around 10 oh, wow. meters of hot coals, and people would get through to the other side and go, Yahoo! I could do anything I want! Fear into power! And I walked through it, and I went, I can do anything I want! What do I want to do? And I got depressed and got into a taxi. So this idea of knowing what we want speaks very much to the idea of an intention, because I can't have an intention without a want preceding it, so to, to want something. Now, we also have to be careful of how big is the want. It's got to be something that's approachable, accessible. If it's too big, we set ourselves up for failure again. And then the, all the good intentions aren't worth anything. But if I can start small and kind of take myself step by step, which is really, you know, the, the, the book is a workbook. It's a step-by-step -step process to bring you to a point. What point would I hope people would get to? I'd hope people would get to the point where they don't need the book anymore, that they're generating themselves. Or the book is there as a resource to go back to if they fall off the cart at some point. That how do I regain my intention? How do I clarify? And, and look, I want to be careful with this idea of want because... That often people make too, like, I, I want to be famous or I, I want to write a book or something like, I, you know how many people tell me they want to write a book? And I go, good. So are you sitting down every day for three or four hours? Because <laughs> that's what it takes to do something like that. So we have all these great ideas, but how do we move these ideas into something concrete, which goes right back to the beginning where I talked about kindness as a definition, it doesn't tell you how to do it, right? It's the how, the concrete thing that makes the difference, I think, for anybody in anything. And I think if you look at any person who's highly successful, you can see what they do and how they do it. They're not someone who's just flowing around with ideas or stuff like that. So, yeah, That's the intentionality a... is it's connected, as you can see, to many different things. Yeah, Absolutely. If you had to sort of list 
the challenges that perhaps people have when they want to embrace a, a kinder way of living? What would you say? Yeah. The challenges, well, the first challenge is that they judge themselves too quickly for not succeeding enough. And that might, it might be the size of the, uh, the thing that they're thinking about, or, or, or they may be impatient with themselves, right? But then there's a the question like, how does one measure one's own sense of kindness? Like I've heard it said about humility, that someone can't say that they're humble. Someone else says you're humble. If you say you're humble, it's kind of lacking in humility. Oh, I'm really humble. It kind of doesn't make sense. And the same thing with kindness. It's like, am I kind? Can I say that I'm a kind person? Well, I can, of course. But really, the, the judge of who's telling me, who's saying that I'm kind is someone else, you know? And even if someone else says, you are so kind, but if I can't receive that, if I can't take that in, then there's, there's, a, there's um, a gap in the whole understanding of kindness, that it's got to be in both directions. And so I think patience, I think going to judgment too quickly are some of the challenges. I think taking on too big a task or not giving ourselves enough time to evaluate it. Like sometimes... Some of my students sometimes, like I have practitioners and my own graduates who come to me and say, uh, you know, my practice isn't what I would hope it would be. And we talk and I say, well, have you tried this? No, try that. They come back three, four months later and same thing. They're not satisfied. It's not what they want it to be. And I said, well, have you tried this? Yeah. Have you tried this? Yeah. Have you tried this? No, try that. And I get to this same point every time. It usually takes three or four cycles where I say to someone, have you tried this? And they say, oh, I'm not comfortable doing that. And I went, oh, and it's really interesting because the ones who tolerate the discomfort and do it, their practices take off. And the ones who don't, it stays the same. So you can see that that challenge of, we have to be a little uncomfortable sometimes to change. I start the book out talking about that, that this is not, probably not going to be comfortable at moments, right? Or I can talk with someone and, you know, show them something that might be useful for them, and I'll say to them, how long do you think it'll take to change this habit? And they say, three weeks, a month, two months? No, a year and a half to two years. And they go, what do you mean? And I go, think about it. If you said six months, and in six months, it hasn't changed, you just beat yourself up again. You're a failure. But if you say a year and a half to two years, after six months, you think, ooh, I have another year. After a year, I have another six months. And we're learning to, in, 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 by extending the time frame of our expectation, we're really learning how to be kind to ourselves. I think that's one of the hardest places to practice that. But it, it, we need, I need that, you know. So. I think everybody needs that, and especially extending the time frame that we use yeah. uh, and, and we put on ourselves because we live in a, in a world, in a society that goes very fast. So we, yeah. we get used to it has to be done by yesterday. And right. sometimes the secret is really slowing down, as you said at the very beginning, yeah. right? Rather than going yeah. going faster. So mm -hmm. these are the challenges. And instead, if you had to think of misconceptions uh, around embracing, mm -hmm. because one of the things I, I can think of, for example, is that if you start being kinder, perhaps people may take advantage of you. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that could be, oh, you know, I don't want to be taken advantage of. So are there misconceptions that really can be a kind of yeah. showstopper for people. I think there are a lot of misconceptions. I think, I mean, to follow up on the last thing you said, I think it goes back to boundaries. Like in, in my work in the Feldenkrais Method, I had a student come up to me once and she had this great idea and she presented it and I looked at her and I said, no, no, what do you mean no? I said, no. And she said, I thought 
this work was about being flexible. I said, it is, but it's also about knowing that when not to be flexible, right? And then I went on to explain to her the ramifications of her idea and why it really wouldn't work. And she was like, oh, I never thought of any of those things, you know? So, so another misconception I think that exists in people is around generosity. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of a friend giving you a gift that just feels too big, but they're being generous. And of course, you can't, it's, it, it is a generous act. You have to accept it. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's, it, it, what I end up feeling is, oh, now I have to give them a big gift too. And it builds this thing where it's out of proportion to, to what's acceptable to both of us. Yeah. You know? So in the book, I talk about generosity through the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. So Goldilocks gives one bear, a little baby bear, uh, for their birthday, uh, a pair of socks. But she didn't pick out the socks. These were socks that someone gave to her, and she didn't want them. So she was re-gifting, which is fine. Of course, we all re-gift. I think it's a good action. But did she really think about it? Right? Is it something that the, the, she thought the bear really wanted? Not really. And then to the other bear, to the mother, to the father bear, she gave this huge widescreen TV that she couldn't even afford. Now, is that a gift of generosity? It seems like it, but if it's something I can't afford, I'm not being very kind to myself in that. And then to the mama bear, she gave a frying pan that the mama bear always wanted, coveted. And, and Goldilocks wished she could give her the whole set, but she could only afford the one pan. But the, the mother was so happy to get that. And, you know, if you think about that, how often when we give someone a gift, how thoughtful are we? What's the right proportion? So I think there's a big misconception in terms of what it means to be generous and how to be generous. And is there a way we can understand this? But we have to reflect on it. Again, it's not something that we just say, well, the way I do it is right. That's it. You know, I think if someone really has a, 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 a difficulty deciding on what to get someone, I have this great thing that someone taught me once, which is you flip a coin. And you know, you, you flip a coin, heads, I'm going to go there, tails, I'm not going to go, right? So you flip a coin, and while it's in the air, it's like, I'm going to give this gift to someone. Heads, I'm going to give the gift. Tails, I'm not going to give the gift. And as I'm, it's in the air, I just notice, what am I hoping for? And I never look at the coin. Because intuitively, I think I know our intuition is pretty strong around these things. And we can go, oh, no, it's just not the right gift, you know. So misconceptions, yeah, there's misconceptions. But, but I would say, I would look at misconceptions in another way, actually. I would look at misconceptions as a perspective. And so if that, if that perspective is a misconception, can I change my perspective? How do I change my perspective? How do I see things in a different way? And that's about creating more choices so that I'm not relegated to my habits and one way of doing something and that I can act differently in different situations. So then the, the misconception doesn't have the same hold on me when I've learned to do those kinds of things. Mm. Maybe that sometimes we give a value to that gift, for example, and uh, we sort of way, uh, you know, the, the level of uh, kindness or generosity to yeah. that, that value. And perhaps yeah. what for me is a small value for the other person might be huge and, and vice versa. Yeah, right. And then, and then they, they don't feel good about that mm. if, it's, if it's too big. Or, look, we probably know more often the experience of too small, like, that's what you got me for my birthday? Thank you. Oh. Mm. <laughs> I never wear ties, but it's good to have another one. Thank you. You know, it's kind of like, but then, uh, you know, I, I have friends who, how is, this is going to sound a little weird maybe, but I would say that they, they're not very good at choosing gifts for anybody. And once I realize that, then I don't get upset if they give me a gift that seems a little weird or odd or something like that, because they do that with everyone. It's not a personal statement about me and how they think about me or judging myself or something like that, or then judging them back again like that. It's like being able to really graciously accept it, go, thank you. 
That's really good. And because I accept the meaning and the intention behind it as a value. Fantastic. I don't know, I would like to take the conversation towards something uh, beyond the person, the, the, the self, and the person on, on the other side. Uh, that's what we might yeah. think. And uh, set the boundary towards society. Uh, we started at the very uh-huh. beginning thinking, uh, saying that we live in unprecedented times. Uh, there are lots of changes, a lot of fear, perhaps uh, uncertainty. Right. Do you think that we can use kindness, intentional acts of kindness, also to sort of change the paradigm of the life we yeah. we live today, and perhaps yeah. address some of these uh, larger societal issues that we have, reduce austerity, uh, promoting more understanding between people, uh, create more connection. And uh, I feel that sometimes we, we are disconnected and overcome things like um, diversity, for example, or create more inclusion yeah. and, and more understanding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well... I've thought about this. You know, at at the time that I finished the book in the United States, Joe Joe Biden had won the election and was going to become president. Trump was going out. And, you know, the world seemed pretty mad at that point to me. And it was regardless of who you voted for, who you sided with, that was really of no issue. And I started thinking, is that, wouldn't it be great if there was a person who was like this, mega negotiator who knew how to help people solve conflicts and do things. And of course, pretty quickly I realized, yeah, that's like we, like Gandhi or something, you know, maybe, but I mean, is there anyone like that? I couldn't think of anyone like that. And then I discovered that Richard Branson and Peter Gabriel had put together this thing called the Elders, the Elders, I can't remember, it's just the Elders, that was to, to a number of people to guide other people with some wisdom about how to do things like that. And then I had this great idea, which wasn't a great idea. The great idea was, what if we had the Dalai Lama and the Pope and a great rabbi and a great imam and have them kind of help guide us through things? And then I realized how many hundreds of other religions there I left out. And they're all going to be resentful. And it's like United Nations of Religions. Like the United Nations was probably intended in some way to what you're speaking about. Has it been successful? No, not really. I mean, maybe in some ways, but not at the extent that you're talking about. And then, and really what I'm going to say now is not my idea. It's not new. But it speaks to the idea of kindness, which is the only place I know where we can start is with ourselves. With the hope that if enough of us gets to a certain mass, that maybe the world will change. But it has to do with listening and understanding and patience and failing at it and going at it again. And instead of saying, well, I tried and I'm done, say I'm not done. I'm not done promoting kindness. You know, if, if, my, if my book wasn't successful or if, if people didn't like the idea, I'm still not done because I believe in it, right? And for me, to have that kind of conviction behind it is what carries us forward, right? And, you know, if, if, if in, in listening to the podcast, if only one person bought the book and benefited from it, I'd be happy. You know, that's worthwhile to me, you know? So, so it's not like I have to reach everyone. I don't know anyone who can change the world. And I, I think part of how the world is today is because we, everything goes so fast. So there's not much time for reflection. Of course, things like social media and stuff just, boom, shift everything so quickly that we, we can't adapt quickly enough. Absolutely. Perhaps we, we have to start with a newer generation, with the, with the children, and start from school, for example, and and start to inspire them into kinder uh, adults. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, um, it's something perhaps that is, uh, that is due, you know, to include uh, a school, for example, topics that right now are not taught, right? right? 
Uh, yeah. We go through maths and uh, literature and foreign languages and all these kind of uh, beautiful subjects. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But perhaps sometimes we don't put enough attention to other topics that these children will yeah. need. Uh, so, later. Right. so, yeah, perhaps something to, yeah. to consider. Well, you know, school education, I mean, if you think, I mean, is there an education that really deals with the everyday life interactions we have. You know, I mentioned an author in my book called Marshall Rosenberg, who developed something called nonviolent communication. And he's been around, well, he's passed away now, but he's around for a long time. And um, he had nonviolent communication schools, that schools that took on these um, values, right, to start to teach children. And yeah, I mean, if we could do that and teach children, but yeah, it's a place yeah, to start. Quite a, quite a start, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, going back to the sphere of, of the self and in particular the, the mental health, if you like, kind of uh, mm -hmm. aspect, uh, because this podcast was uh, created out of uh, a burnout uh, as a you know, uh, I wanted to to raise awareness about stigma around mental health and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Do you think mm -hmm. that intentional acts of kindness towards ourselves and others can also support mental health and, and stay oh, yeah. and stay balanced and uh, create that level of self compassion uh, as well? Yeah. I, I, well, how could it not? That would be my first thought, right? And then again. It's a question of degree. Like, if someone has mental health issues where there's an imbalance in their sense of priorities, in both positive and negative, like if someone who really mis mis misconceives their own priorities and they hear about generosity, all of a sudden they're spending all their money buying people gifts and they don't realize. So that's a mental health issue that needs to be contained in a different way. But it's not about kindness, it's about that person's individual issue or something like that. But when I, when I think, if I think of mental health in, in maybe not in the extreme cases, but in the more everyday cases where people are more depressed or lonely or um, just unhappy in some way, then yeah, I, I do think it can. But honestly, People I know who are in those conditions are better at that than I am in convincing them to be kind, meaning they can flip it around into a negative state. So there again, it has to be something small, something where they can find a modicum of success in it. And But they need, I mean, if it's a serious mental health issue, then yeah, they need more guidance than just a book to do something like that. But... I would hope, because, you know, the people I know who suffer, they're, it, be kind to themselves is really almost impossible. Mm. You know, that's, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, also continuing on, on this uh, idea, um, you know, with the, with the podcast uh, that is called Forgive and Drive, uh, can, yeah. can we put intentional kindness in, in between and, uh, is there a connection with forgiveness on one end and uh, the ability oh. to thrive on, on the other? Yeah. I think, I think forgiveness, the, the result of forgiveness is, like you said, thriving. That we thrive if we can forgive. But it's forgiving not just the others who've hurt us, but forgiving ourselves too, you know? I talk about in the book, uh, about the kind of internal conversations that we have sometimes. Like, I've had relationships that fell apart in some way, and like, I'm done. But then if someone mentions that person's name, I go into the story and I tell it or I ruminate about it, or I just hear the name and I think about the event and I realize I'm not done. I'm really not done. And I have a couple of choices there. One, I can say I'm done and just put a wall up, but it's still irritating me. I don't think that's done, right? Another thing is I can learn to let it go. And maybe that happens through seeing a counselor or someone or a friend talking it through until I finally realize, how do I know that I'm done? 
is when I feel more compassionate towards that person who upset me instead of resenting them. Or maybe if I have the courage and the skill to do it, to contact the person and say, you know, I don't know if you'd be open to it, but I would love to have a conversation. It would really help me to talk about some of the things that happened. And maybe, now if the person says no, that's clear. Then you're done. There's no one to talk to. But if the person says yes, and it's a tricky road, it's a lot of rough terrain sometimes, to be able to say, well, let's see if we can, doesn't mean we're going to be friends again, but that we can both walk away without having to carry on this internal conversation in our head like that. You know, so I think that would be um, another way to think about both forgiveness and the outcome of thriving from it and to learn to forgive. I mean, that's like, that's a pretty big thing. That's a pretty big thing. You know, when, when I wrote this book, I can't tell you how many people, how many, what's your next book? When I, what are you kidding me? I just it took me years to write this book. What do you mean my next book? But I came up with an idea for my next book. And it kind of relates to, to forgiveness, I think. And it's about the idea of being offended. And I think that almost all negative emotions can be put under that umbrella, whether it's entitlement or jealousy or anger or frustration. There's almost always an element of being offended. And I still find that for myself, that I'm in a, online and someone, I get offended. Why am I getting offended? I mean, what's, what's so important here that I have to get that upset about something like that? But when I think of the antidote to being offended, one of the antidotes is to be able to forgive. Uh, I'll write it one day, not today. <laughs> <laughs> well, then let's talk uh, about the plans for maybe uh, on a shorter time. So what are you working right now? What are you planning? Uh, is there anything that you want to share with us? Well, I mean, there's kind of two tracks right now. One is my work as a Feldenkrais practitioner and trainer. And most of my work is training people. And right now, I have two trainings here in Santa Fe and one in Belgium, one in France, and starting one in Taiwan. So my schedule is booked up for the next four years. Solid. Right. So that's when I think about writing another book. It's like, well, am I going to find the time to do this? Because I need time to sit down and do it. And then, of course, the other path is exactly what I'm doing with you right now is promoting the book, not knowing where it's going to go or where it's going to lead, but with the hopes that it plants a seed for somebody to, to feel better about themselves and act better towards others as well. So that's, that's my schedule right now. <laughs> Fantastic. So if our listeners would like to get in touch with you, perhaps, or simply know more what you, what you do. Yeah, right? sure. they can find Well, the, the, the book has its own website, which is practicing-kindness.com. And then I've got a few other websites. And, and probably, honestly, the easiest way to find me is just to Google my name. And you'll find my websites on Feldenkrais trainings and my private practice and um, YouTube stuff and things like that. So, and Facebook, I'm all over that stuff. So, yeah, that'd be the easiest way. And uh, in some of those places, there's my email address and stuff. And if if you email me, if I don't respond to you in three days, I didn't get it. So I respond to all emails. Fantastic. And we will put all of this information, all the links in the right. description of this episode. And final question. Uh, if there was one take-home message that you would love everybody to remember from this conversation what that would be if you're kind you can be a lot kinder if you feel stuck or trapped in your life it will change and often when we're in that place it's the possibility of being different seems never but it changes now this people when i say it'll change i think you mean for the better well what if it got a little worse? What if it got worse and then you came back to where you are now? That would be feeling better, right? So things change in both directions. And knowing that can keep us moving forward towards learning what we want and then find and engaging and creating what we want. 
Oh, I absolutely love that. Well, I hope that this episode has provided insights and inspiration on how through intentional acts of kindness, we can carry the torch of compassion forward, uniting countless lives along the way. In a world that thirsts for goodness, each deliberate act of kindness can be the spark that sets the world aglow. Let's be the change that we wish to see and uh, one intentional act of kindness at a time. And I want to leave you with a quote from Lao Tzu who said, kindness in words creates confidence. Kindness in thinking creates profoundness. Kindness in giving creates love. Yeah. Alan, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, for sharing so much about yourself and the work you do. Uh, I live, really loved every single moment of this uh, conversation. Thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed every moment of it as well. Fantastic. Well, we would love to know what you think about this topic. What intentional act of kindness can you do today? Let us know. Also, don't forget to check Alan's website and his book. And to follow him on social media, you will find all the links in this episode description. Join me next time when we will continue exploring inspiring and challenging situations. Because remember, we are together in this journey. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this content, subscribe to our channel and don't forget to hit the notification bell and like this video. See you in the next one.